Hey, deserving listeners. So for those who have been around in the podcast for a long time, you know that I have been thinking a lot about loneliness. Even before the pandemic, I knew that it was a problem around the globe, and a lot of people are suffering from it. And a lot of the advice that is given online for curing loneliness is insufficient or trite in some way. And I set out to try to figure out if I could get my head around or hands around the problem. And the more I looked into it, the more elusive it got. There's a lot of roads to loneliness, a lot of factors. I mean, we can look at the big things like people on their phones too much and that sort of thing, but that that's too simplistic. I think that there's just this general trend that's been happening for decades that is resulting in a lot of loneliness. And not just suffering from loneliness, of course, but depression and demoralization and health problems and increase in addiction and suicide. These are all outgrowths of the increase in loneliness that's been demonstrated by the evidence. The other thing that I think about sometimes is artificial intelligence and AI. Uh, I remember the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix not too long ago and seeing that in the theater and at the time thinking, well, yeah, I mean, we've known about that sort of possibility of a an AI a robot of some kind that can be a companion or can seem very human. And of course, at some point in the distant future, that'll be a reality, but probably not in our lifetime. And then all of a sudden, this AI explosion happens this last year. And of course, AI has been in development for decades, but in terms of its commercial use has exploded in the past year. And as I'm using it, and I, I use it a lot. The other day, I was just daydreaming about how horrible the scripts were for the Star Wars sequel movies, you know, episodes seven, eight, and nine. And I was thinking, I wonder if AI could write a better script than, oh, no, no. What I was thinking was, was the Obi-Wan Kenobi TV show on Disney+. Plus. I, I was thinking about how horrible the script was for that. And I wondered if AI could write a better script. And so I I, you know, typed in a bunch of prompts into chat GPT 3.5 and it, it gave a much better script. And I, I thought, you know, of course, there's this writer strike going on and they're protesting AI taking over their jobs. And of course, I'm all for that labor movement and the strike. But there's another thing here. It's like <laughs> if, if AI can write a better, at least outline of a script, uh, uh, it, it's, it's interesting to me. And and then uh, uh, as I'm writing the prompts, the first draft of this script is not exactly what I was looking for. So I just typed in without you know typing in the whole uh, prompt again. I just said, hey, um, change this one part in the last script. And then it just rewrote without complaining. <laughs> And just rewrote the script, and and I kept I, d I did about five to ten more prompts, and I each time I wanted to tell Chat GPT I, I'm sorry I don't want to bother you, but could you change this one part? And it felt like I was working with a with a an, a sentient being who was writing the script with me. You know, we were sort of collaborating on this thing. And so when you think about loneliness and companionship and AI. I don't think we're that far away from that. <laughs> I think we're very close. And then, of course, when you get the deep fake stuff going on, you you get a, a 3D image of someone that's moving and talking and uh, emoting in the world. You not just have you don't just have a typed you know AI, but you have maybe spoken word and you have the visual and the eye eye contact. And I, I just think that there's a chance that given trends that AI is going to become a part of our, of course, it's going to be part of our lives in the future, but I think it might be soon. And then you think, okay, well, if AI can solve some loneliness, is that good or bad? <laughs> because of course, the cure for loneliness would be human contact. So uh, that's, we're capable of that. There's a lot of humans on the planet. So what if AI actually solves the problem and What's the ethical and moral and human implications for that? It's just a bizarre thing to think about. Of course, I knew this was going to happen, but I think it's happening very soon. I think in five to 10 years, this will be a reality. So I 
asked a special guest, an expert on this, Janetta George, to come on the podcast to talk about it. Welcome to the podcast, Janetta. Thanks, Kirk. It's really great to be here. And yeah, I'm, I'm excited to to get into this with you. And in particular, some of the things that you're saying now is really similar to a lot of things that I'm constantly hearing about, thinking about how AI is going to be coming or is currently in the, the main screen and, and going to be. But, you know, really, in reality, it's been here since the 1950s. And so there there's a lot of history to dig into to really understand how it's gotten to this point right now and how it can, um, you know, help us in the future. But um, but yeah, I, I'd love to tell you a little bit about how I got here in AI and, and also how I started really studying loneliness um, and, and how AI plays into it. Okay, tell me. Um, so I, uh, there, there are so many different stories about how people get into AI. I've been an AI engineer for about the past decade or so. Um, I started off being a, a student of theoretical mathematics, just loved studying puzzles and uh, wanted to become a professor at some point. And then uh, as you can probably relate, <laughs> there's a, a lot of years going into the studying and not a lot of reward at the end of it. And, uh, and you know, I, I ended grad school not knowing what I was going to do. And that was right around, I wanna say 2018 when data science and AI was really becoming a big thing. And I was like, okay, I've, I've taught for a few years, um, done the graduate studies thing. Let's, let's try to actually work for a company. And, um, and it was a really great decision for me. I really loved what I was doing. I, I was a, an AI engineer at a water company, um, jumped around, started doing consulting, eventually started doing um, some um, executive advisory, working for companies like Apple, Amazon, um, you know, companies doing really cutting edge things with natural language, um, things like that. Um, and, and I'm still doing that today. So I, I still work as a consultant, but I also dabble in, uh, in startup space. And I, I started developing this app and it's still being developed. So this is by no means a, a, an advertisement for, <laughs> for my app, but I started developing this app that I'm calling Candor, um, really meant to tackle the loneliness epidemic. And the reason for it was I moved to Miami. I, I live in Miami right now. I've been here about two years and, and I've always kind of been a nomad, jumping from place to place. I was you know, born in New Jersey, moved to Denver for school, then moved to Sweden for school, Philly, and then you know, so on and so forth, um, and never really lived anywhere for more than a year. And just realized there has to be a better way to plug in to people, to um, get to meet people that you wouldn't normally meet or being new to town and, and wanting to meet people. Um, and then that coupled with, this was the middle of the pandemic. So I moved to Miami in 2021. Everyone was becoming very remote. No one wanted to go out. Um, actually, we were just getting back to the point where people were starting to socialize again, but didn't really know how to do it because we'd been locked up for a year. Um, so I, I wanted to develop an app that kind of took all of the great technology that Facebook and Google and other companies had already used in terms of like that social graph of how do we think about data and connecting people um, and using that to connect people locally and to get them going to events, but also meeting people and uh, maybe meeting people in a more ethical way, whereas we kind of live in our own, you know, ego chambers, we, we have biases, whether we know it or not, um, when we're meeting and when we're thinking of who we want to meet. So how can we actually use data instead of enhancing biases to alleviate some of those biases and open our minds to, uh, to people that we're connecting with? Really? So are you saying maybe using AI, like it's tinder for friends but it's using ai to make it easier for people to look past their biases is that what you're saying yeah exactly and that that's one component of it right because so just you know at a at a basis i know that there are people listening to this podcast that have lots of different um entry points to technology and ai so instead of going super into it um at a high level ai the way it learns is from the data that you teach it you know i think with Chat GPT um, coming to the main scene. We're we're getting to know more and more about the technology as just a general public. But one thing to know is that the way that AI works is you feed it a whole bunch of data, and it ends up learning patterns from that data, and then basically regurgitates it, kind of like um, a child. You know, you teach it over and over again. 
pictures of cats and pictures of dogs. And eventually it says that's the cat and that's the dog. So AI is basically like a toddler. <laughs> um, and then the more data that we, we feed to it, it becomes a, a more advanced toddler and hopefully eventually an adult. Um, so yeah, so the, the concept of building in a, a more ethical way of meeting people, really it's just saying, hey, we're gonna feed you data about Kirk's preferences of people. Maybe he prefers meeting people between the age of 45 and 55 that live in the Seattle area that are into music and into psychology, X, Y, Z. Um, that would be a little bit more on the biased side. We might want to try to remove some of those factors that we know about you while still incorporating things that we think would be a good match generally for people to try to match them together in a way that will still be beneficial to them, but in ways that they might not even know. What sort of data would be entered on each individual? Yeah, um, and, and that's a good question because this is where it starts to be really important of, you know, making sure that we're, we're being ethical about the data, not only that we're collecting, but the data that we're using. Um, so, you know, the, the basic things that I just mentioned about like interests, where you live, where you go to, but then, you know, we also are studying, um, you know, psychology papers and just general research papers of human behavior and how different people interact with each other. Um, and a lot of times these variables are actually latent variables that we're not even necessarily able to point to this person is going to like this person for this reason. It's uh, latent variables, meaning that it's things that you know, but kind of like I said, you can't necessarily point to them, but they create um, they create connections through the data from entering millions and billions of rows of data. So is it farmed data from Google and Facebook? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, um, that's that's one way to do it is the concept of web scraping or, or farming data where you're essentially pulling um, things that are publicly accessible. But we really try to make sure that we're getting data. And I think that this is, you know, general consensus, not just the way that I do things, but like good ethical practices. We collect data um, that, you know, customers and users want to give to you. Um, so it's it's really important that we're asking the right questions of users of like, hey, what do you find interesting? And then asking for feedback. One of the biggest things I always tell people is anytime you get like one of those survey surveys at the end of like any kind of interaction of like, hey, was this useful? Did we give you the right answer? Always answer them because that's literally how AI is getting better at doing what it's doing by you taking like those few seconds. So anyway, it's, it's things like that that are helping um, the, the AI system learn your preferences. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, it stands to reason that if someone consented in a similar way that people consent to, like, there are times when an app or Google will ask me a question and say, like, do you want ads to be tailored to you? Like on Instagram, for example, I, I'm pretty sure that's something that you opt in for. And at first I'm like, no, I don't want you to keep track of my patterns and send me ads, but I'll get ads that don't make any sense when that happens. <laughs> so it, sometimes I enjoy getting ads that are tailored to me because they're products that I, I actually click on and uh, I've bought things through Instagram for better, or for worse <laughs> because of that. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so uh, if uh, that's a consensual above board sort of disclosure, then people would uh, sign up for that. Some people wouldn't because of that reason, but you could see how they might say, sure, uh, feel free to dig through my meta and Google database to figure out who I might hook up with. Uh, as a So is this uh, uh, for friends or for dating or both or what? Yeah, so I mean, the candor the app that I'm developing in particular is it's for friendships. It's like a, an AI social assistant, um, how, how to elevate your social life. Um, they, they do things like this for dating too. Like you probably are familiar with like Bumble and then Bumble BFF, how they're kind of utilizing this, your same data. So if you sign up for, say, Bumble BFF because you want to meet friends and, you know, the, the AI model is collecting all this information that can then be transferred into Bumble if you then decide I want to date someone. Well, let's take a break. and we get back, I'll ask a question. What do you say? Sounds good. So you sent me a list of topics that we could talk about. And one of them uh, is now coming to mind in that, because uh, of course, we know the algorithm 
is this good and bad thing, and it can create echo chambers and can create exacerbation of radicalized ideas. And if someone is in that zone, they might be funneled in a way towards other people that are radicalized or, uh, you know, whether it's a political point of view or some kind of problematic thing for, for the individual and for society, and that they might be funneled to date or become BFFs with someone uh, similar to, to that. Uh, is that making sense? Uh, so my question is, is that a consideration? It absolutely is. And I think that, you know, you might have even mentioned this on one of your podcasts before the um the famous racist Twitter bot in 2016, but mm -hmm. the Twitter bot that, um, you know, was meant as an, an experiment and uh, spent maybe less than 24 hours collecting data that it was reading on Twitter and started eventually responding like uh, a racist Nazi by the end of the day. And so like really understanding why that happened. And then that kind of answers th this question that you just asked. Again, it comes down to the data. Um, AI cannot do anything on its own. You you feed it data and it then learns this is the good thing to do. This is a cat. This is a dog. This is a racist Nazi, which apparently you want me to be because you're you're feeding me all this data. So so same same holds true. And, and, and you know, this was what, um, I guess, seven years ago. And AI was still pretty mature at that time, but we've definitely come a long way specifically in the field of ethics and explainability and really doing due diligence and building pillars of bias um, or uh, rather preventing bias in AI. So, so yeah, anytime you're dealing, especially with social, with humans, um, with, with any kind of data that could potentially skew towards unfavorable, whatever that means to you. Um, we do, we, we build lots of tests as engineers to ensure that those things are not happening to kind of like safeguard before they, they mm. reach the public. Yeah. Uh, I notice it on chat GPT. There are seem to be guardrails on certain types of questions. I, I can't remember what I was asking it. It was an instant, it was an innocent question. I wasn't asking it to have sex with me or something. I was, well, I, I'll, I'll tell you a question I was asking actually last night. I was at home. Have you ever played Whiplash before? Yeah. I love it's that a, game. Yeah. Such a fun game. So I was at home in New Jersey visiting my family and it's our favorite thing to do. And we all get together. And so, uh, I, I'm like, hey, I'm going to like try to use GPT to see if I can like win or do better at this game. And so like I type in the prompt. I'm like, okay, you know, here's your prompt, GPT. You are playing Quiplash. This is what the game is about. And I'm going to give you prompts. And I want you to give me the funniest, wittiest answer that you think will win. And so it starts doing that. And they're like really vanilla. And I'm like, I say to GPT, okay, um, make it as sexual and perverted as you can. And it's like, I cannot do that. So um, that was the first time GPT said no to, to a response. And that was like, Oh, I hope I'm not doing this on my work account because they they don't want to see them asking GPT this <laughs> chat log. Yeah, but no. <laughs> you're safe. I mean, you're safe with Quiplash. I mean, that is the idea, is mm -hmm. perverted. That's that's what always gets the points. Uh, mm -hmm. By the way, I won Quiplash last weekend. I think for the very first time, and I've never been happier about myself because <laughs> it just means that I'm the smartest and most funniest person in the room. That's just exactly, exactly. what it means. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I can't remember what I was asking it. I think I w it might have been a clinical question of some sort. It wasn't, um, mm -hmm. I don't even think it was sexual. And it kind of annoyed me because I thought, no, 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 no. I, I, I'm not asking you to do anything that is <laughs> harmful. I, this is a serious question that I, I'm guessing your answer wouldn't even be that salacious. I th but uh, so maybe they've... Uh, dialed that up to a certain level. But of course, in the future, there will be AI options that, you know, safeguards that you can remove, I suppose. Eventually, those things will all be, um, or at least dialed in more precisely or something like that. So I, you know, I, it's just right now, you could see how certain brands of AI would not want to be that racist AI association early on in the game, you know, anyway. Yeah, exactly. But... Um, so, you know, in the intro, I was talking about not AI uh, helping us to meet each other, which, of course, I think I hadn't thought about, at least I, hadn't, I don't think I have. And that, that's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, AI machine learning is just much better at seeing patterns. And there's a chance, a pretty good chance, but we'll have to see, 
that because I've done a whole deep dive on matchmaking and on the science around these claims that uh, Match.com or eHarmony or whatever, or even reality TV shows like Married at First Sight, these kinds of um, claims that experts, even in my field, will say that, no, no, we have an algorithm or we have research. And the evidence is uh, is very strong in the direction of it's basically a coin flip. Maybe you can get a little bit better, but that's not great. I mean, uh, uh, people are just naturally better than a coin flip, coin flip because when they just see someone across a room, they're generally better than a coin flip as to whether or not things might work out with that person as to whether or not no way that you know things won't work out. So, so well, a question for you, though, I, I'm curious, because um, I've heard you say that many times. And I've, I've thought about when you say that, I wonder if, um, you know, with the advent of AI being used for these kinds of things, and the massive amount of data and um, human behavior that we're feeding into it, do you feel like um, we have a better shot of being able to do it using AI, potentially? Yeah, I'm not only just that information, which, of course, is way deeper not only in terms of data, but in terms of analysis. Because, you know, when, when we're doing the analysis uh, or in the data gathering, we're, we're surveying people, which, you know, you can't survey them for months. You can only ask them a number of questions or, you know, at most maybe like five hours of them clicking yes, no, or Likert scale kind of stuff. And then we're looking at associations with correlations, and we're looking at couples that actually last. So, that is uh, uh, far better than just randomly pointing at someone from across the room, but not much better because the magic of attraction and staying together is way more complicated than that. But with AI, you are feeding in a lot more data potentially and real data, not just survey, because surveys, people answer the way they want to answer. They don't answer yeah. necessarily from a place of honesty or, or self-awareness. And the pattern recognition, you know, AI can figure out things that is bizarre. They'll, they'll figure out, well, actually, you know, in the black box of the AI, they make an association that is like, well, they both like muffins on Yelp. And we have determined by our machine learning that that's, you know, uh, has a certain weight in terms of whether or not these two people are compatible, not just on the muffin front, but on a, there's certain a lot of things that are associated with liking muffins, having the Yelp app and publicly stating you like muffins, you know, like that wouldn't be something that you would ask on a survey. It wouldn't occur to a psychologist to even include that in the research. The other thing though, that AI can do is look at pictures of people and maybe full body scans, which is not usually included in these in this research because it's way more subjective, one, and a little taboo for researchers to sit back and say, well, I'm going to rate that person, you know, a five in, on the body scale <laughs> and, a, and a three on the face scale. Or so. You know, res we tend to avoid that and try to look more towards personality. And people tend to talk that way, too. People, you know, you say, well, what sort of partner are you looking for? You're like, well, I want someone that's family oriented. But the way people behave, it's way, there's a lot of visual and a lot of vibe and a lot of smells and a lot of, you know, just groinal attraction that happens that is not easily uh, uh, measured. But with AI, you just got to figure there's going to be a signal in the data there, right? When you, you just gather like thousands of couples that, you know, have been together for five to 10 years, and then you just scan them all physically <laughs> and, or maybe just look at their Instagram posts and the AI can figure out like symmetry of eyes and tone of skin and how big the smile is and maybe the tone of voice in some of their video you know posts on Instagram and you got to figure that it, the machine learning is going to see something in that. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I've been on the dating apps uh, for embarrassingly long. I've actually been on dating apps since I was 19 and I'm 33 now. So <laughs> do the math on how long that is. <clears throat> but well, you, you must you must have some stories to tell. Oh, gosh, I, I have some stories to tell. <laughs> but I, I think the point is, though, that um, people that chronically are, you know, using dating apps, we have kind of turned into machines a little bit ourselves in the way that we process the data that we're seeing so 
just to like give give an example, um, you know, maybe years and years ago when I was on like a Tinder or a Hinge and looking at someone's picture, you know, you um you, you don't really think too much of it. You just say that's an attractive person. I find you attractive. I'm reading the things that, that you're writing. I they, they check the boxes and then we'll go out. But you do that a hundred, you know, so many times, and eventually you start to read through the cracks and see, okay, you know this person is smiling this way or they're like these they're they're always posting selfies or things like little things that you don't pick up at first that you start to pick up and you start to be able to be able to tell um and maybe this is just me becoming uh you know uh, jaded <laughs> to, to online dating of like oh i don't want to go out with anyone anymore but you start to really weed through things much quicker and i'm sure that you know the machines are also picking up on that and uh can probably do it way better for us and that's why you know on apps like hinge they they do have really great algorithms and the more you pay the better algorithms they give to you of like saying hey like you're definitely gonna like this person um and and it works pretty good hmm. so give us one thing that you learned about pictures on tinder that you say nope that you wouldn't have realized when you first started looking at it <laughs> um, Picture, pictures with motorcycles uh, no, I, I ride motorcycles. Oh, okay. I ride Vespas living here okay. in Miami. So if you're posting a picture on a Vespa, that's a thumbs up for me. Um, no, I, I do think it's the the selfie. And I think that applies for, for men and women, like having like one selfie, totally acceptable. But there are some people on there that it's all selfies. Uh, What's that? And what does that indicate ooh, to you? Yeah. To the learning that you have made over time? Good question. Um, so I think that it indicates a little bit of a lack of discernment or like introspection, um, self-awareness a little bit, because, you know, people want to see you like out doing different things. They want to see variety. They want to see um, just you in the wild, uh, getting like your personality. But when you're just posting selfies, you're, what you're getting from them, what you're learning is that they just stay in their house looking at the mirror taking selfies. Um, and that's not a desirable trait necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one selfie is enough. Beyond that, it's just more selfies, right? So yeah. what's the point in that? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, let's take another break. We'll get back. More questions. Okay, we're back from the break. But what about... What I was saying in the intro about how, like the movie Her, did you see that movie, Joaquin Phoenix? I didn't, so you're going to have to tell me a little bit about it. <laughs> oh, well, in some future of our society, there's this fellow named Joaquin Phoenix, <laughs> or played by Joaquin Phoenix, and, and he uh, he just went through a breakup, I think, and there's this new operating system, and he uh, opts in to get it and he feeds it some information and it slowly starts to uh, grow on him. At first, he's just kind of like, ah, it's just this AI that you talk to and it seems kind of human, but it's not really human. But over time, he starts to really get into a deep relationship and the way that the movie is written and directed and acted, at least for me and I think a lot of the viewers, it doesn't feel creepy and it isn't creepy in the end. It's it's not like, and then she kills him or anything, you know. It's it's played, it, there is an interesting ending that I won't spoil, but it, it seems real, you know, it seems real. But um, a lot of people are seemingly falling in love with their AI. And you can see why. I mean, they even have like phone sex with the AI, and the AI has what the AI believes to be an orgasm <laughs> during that, right? I don't know. It, it, it was, it's a powerful movie, and I just imagine in the not-so-near future that that will be a thing. So uh, uh, what are your thoughts on that? It, it already is a little bit of a thing, and I'll start by just saying a little bit of history. Um, so first of all, there are three types of AI. So there is the narrow, or sometimes AI engineers would call it the, the stupid or the dumb AI. Um, there's the general AI, and then there is uh, the super AI. So narrow AI basically is just like doing like a, a single task. Um, so, you know, you might have like a recommendation system that's recommending products to you. You might have like a few of them on like a website like Amazon. Um, general AI then is a conglomerate of 
lots of different algorithms that are basically coming together and trying to do something that a human would be able to do. Um, so you think back to, um, I don't know, when I was a kid, there was like this movie on Disney Channel, something like Smart House. So I kind of think of that like a, a, a robot that can like do anything that a human can do. Super AI, though, is being able to do things even better than, uh, than a human. Um, so Back in, I want to say 1950, Alan Turing, uh, this is kind of like the, the birth of AI, aside from like science fiction that that happened like, you know, a few decades leading up to that. Um, but then 1950, Alan Turing um, wrote a, a paper, Can Machines Think? Um, and he was also the inventor of the Turing test. Are you familiar with the Turing test? Uh -huh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, for listeners uh, who might not know, it's it's a really simple concept. It's basically you have um, two different judges, or, or sorry, you, you have a, a bunch of judges in a room and they are trying to see, are you a human or are you a robot or a computer? Really simple question. And so the, the person being judged or the uh, robot being judged is asked a bunch of questions. And then at the end, the panel of judges says, you are human or you are a robot. Um, and it was thought for a really long time that this would, um, you know, we would never be able to, uh, to have a, a machine that was able to pass the Turing test. Um, we went through a long AI winter throughout the 70s and 80s where there was very little research being done in AI just because we, um, we kind of like had this high hopes coming off of, you know, the sci-fi um, like 40s, 50s of thinking AI is going to be you know, doing all these amazing things in the next 10 years, and then it didn't happen. Um, but really, really cool, actually. Um, I think a few months ago, GPT broke the Turing, or it, it, it beat the Turing test, which is a, a really huge accomplishment in AI. So I think just that alone kind of goes to that question of like, are we there? Are, will we be there soon? Um, and this concept of general AI that you know, general um, conglomerate of AI that is able to do what humans do just as well as humans, we're already kind of doing it right now. Um, researchers say that it's probably going to be at least another decade until we're really seeing it widespread in our society. And then a few decades more until we have super AI, just for those of us that are like really scared about it, like doom and gloom from AI, we are still several decades away from AI really truly being able to outsmart us. But in terms of, um, human interaction and being able to like be fooled by an AI system. And I've actually seen documentaries of people talking about this, that they're falling in love with, um, you know, they're uh, not, not necessarily like a, a real robot, but an app that they talk to um, kind of like, you know, when you watch like catfish or, or like 90 day fiance or whatever, where, People are just chatting uh, at a screen and you don't really know if, if it's going to end up being the love of your life or not. It's it's the same thing with AI, but you you know it's not going to be the love of your life. So in some ways, you're actually putting yourself in you know in less harm. There, there's no harm from it other than just knowing that you can never physically touch it. Yeah, I just saw this report of AI women that are scantily clad in a... And these video clips, and they're talking and emoting, and and you can kind of tell by the face that they're AI, but you just got to figure in a couple years, or if more expensive, uh, you know, products were to you know crunch the numbers to make the face look even more realistic, that this will be just around the corner that someone can just type in a prompt and just like, okay, I want a, a woman that looks like this with this kind of hair and DDD, here are the dimensions, here are, here's the sort of personality style. And then you have that, that human uh, lookalike uh, catfish as many people on Instagram that she can, right? And like with other scams along these lines, you only need 0.001% of people to respond with their bank card and you're off and running, right? So are we going to see like 90 Day Fiance AI <laughs> at some point? I mean, it seems like in five years that uh, that will be a thing, right? We've seen others that have been seemingly scammed by, and it what it appears, I don't know if you watched back with David and all that stuff and I, I only barely know his story, but it seems to be that there's certain people or even companies that employ women to, or, or someone of any gender, but they would act like they were a woman and they will 
catfish men in the United States or other countries that have men that have some money and they charge by the minute to chat and they lead them on and say, I'm in love with you. And so the man gets obsessed and is spending all this money and deluding himself. And in the end, he's in a cafe in Russia waiting for her to show up and she never shows. And then she says that I, I missed my bus. I'm so sorry, honey. Um, you know, uh, uh, please forgive me or whatever. You just imagine that an AI would be able to do that infinitely better and with actual video conference and at almost no cost to the scammer. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and and forget about just sex and and romance, but scamming old people. Uh, you could do a deep fake of of someone's child, right? That there's already that happening where they will deep fake someone's voice and call someone's parents that are seventies, eighties years old, and the deep fake of this adult child is saying like, "Oh my God, I'm in the I'm in the hospital. Send me money to this number," and then it's a powerful tool of, of scamming people. But anyway, um, so are there any AI developers working on human emotion and, for example, falling in love or affection for the user? Because it's general AI in terms of write me a better script for Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's, you know, that's it, that's working great, but the person or the not person, but the AI version that's writing the script isn't just like, hey, Kirk, you know, did you read my script? How'd you like it? Like, did, did, did I do a yeah. good job? It, it doesn't give a shit. It's just pumping out this, you know, this thing. Are, are people working on emotions? Yeah. Well, first, really quick um, to go back to what you're saying and then remind me if I forget to come back and answer this question. But um, so GPT, they just did some studies on it about um, like email spam phishing, like content, just showing how insanely fast we're able to create um, phishing emails that are just as accurate or uh, sorry, just as um, effective, good, effective. Thank you. Um, if not more than um, handwritten ones. So there is that coupled with if you want to start talking about deep fakes and, you know, actually turning voice into things. Um, there are apps now that, you know, back in the day, it used to be that you had to collect hours of footage of, you know, President Trump talking to be able to like mimic his voice. Now you literally need two seconds to be able to make something extremely believable. I just saw someone demoing it the other day at a conference. Um, and and that, so that's really wild. Um, and I don't know, do you ever um, watch Scammer Payback on, on YouTube or any of those like YouTube videos? Um, I don't, yeah, yeah, where they, a, a call center from India will be trying yeah. to scam an old lady in the United States and these hackers essentially will hack into their system and re record the whole thing. And, and yeah, yeah I've watched like an anti ha hacker for good. I would love to see them develop a tool that is able to like take old ladies voices and just go on auto and uh, you know, waste spammers time for, you know, hours and hours that that would be um, really enjoyable to watch. I, I would subscribe to that channel. <laughs> but um, yeah, so back to your question, though, about um, are, are there currently AI researchers working on emotion? And it, yes, absolutely. I think that it's it's not an easy question to answer. Like, are we are we working on, um, you know, solving a particular algorithm or building a, a particular model? Um, just because, as you know, as a psychologist, emotion is not an algorithm. <laughs> Simply put, like, it's not something that we can, you know, historically say, like, X plus Y equals Z. Um, and, and now let's just make a model that produces that. Um, so the, the field of research that I've spent a lot of time working in is something called natural language processing, which is um, very, it's, it's one of the big parts of, of this branch of study of AI or, um, you know, um, artificial emotions. And so what natural language processing does exactly as it sounds, it processes language, it will take tons of different um, documents, whatever, um, turn it into a machine binary interpretable form and then be able to extract something from it. So um, one thing that we do is something called um, topic or sentiment analysis. So we've been doing that for, you know, decades and decades where 
you know, you you um, enter in, uh, maybe it's a, a document that you're reading and say, hey, tell me what the mood of this is. Tell me like the vibe, basically, give me a vibe check. Um, and, and we can train, <laughs> We can train models to do that. Um, there are also apps that are being developed right now that are particularly for mental health. Um, I, I remember hearing someone talking about an app that they're building for corporate mental health, um, which there are, are ethics around this that I, I would love to understand, like how they're battling this just in terms of what you're feeding back to, to corporate, uh, you know, to your boss, basically, that might be telling them information that you don't want your boss to know. But it was basically like a welfare check of like, Hey, like, um, you know, tell me different things about yourself. How are you feeling at this time? And it would kind of be able to like track your emotions. So like, you know, being able to understand human emotions, um, but on the flip of the coin, like, how are we able to generate emotions that are believable that, um, I, I think that, you know, the research that we're doing with GPT with, um, the, the concept of, um, you know, reinforcement learning, which you know, I can talk a little bit about how that works and um, just different sophisticated types of AI that are um, letting the machine learn and react really is the thing, um, like being able to react to what you just learned in a positive or negative way. That's really the key to, to those kinds of um, algorithms. Yeah, it seems that if you just went off, and I don't know much about this technology or the research, but it seems like if you're trying to create emotion in the current, at least mainstream AI that I've experienced, then you would just get a bland emotional personality type that was an average of everything that's being fed into it. And of course, you can't just feed in documents like Wikipedia and this sort of thing. You have to feed in a lot of nonverbals, so you'd have to feed in video, I would imagine, and that's being done more, but that's harder data to quantify, right? But of course, machine learning will figure out stuff eventually, because most of the written documents and the things on the internet don't explicitly communicate, or even between the lines communicate any sort of emotion. So, uh, there's, so there's that. But when we interact with human beings, there is a personality that we're dealing with, a consistency across different contexts of emotional tendencies and reactivity. And if it's just a general bland human being that is reacting on average of all human beings that are fed into it, I would imagine that although that maybe would be a certain personality type that would be interesting, but it would uh, just be one human or one personality that everyone interacts with. And of course, uh, for this to be like uh, the way that it will be in the future, I imagine people would want it, their own sort of AI that they're interacting with uh, solely, right? Uh, if they had a friend that was an AI or a partner <laughs> that's an AI, or even just an assistant, uh, a butler, if you will, you, you, you would I think there would be a preference to have a variability or some spe specificity to that to that robot, right? And for that, uh, you'd either have to tinker uh, from the outside or ask the AI to create its own personality or uh, uh, relegate uh, or limit the AI to focus on a certain personality type in, in terms of its data set that it's basing the, the emotion or just let the machine learning develop on its own, you know, because that's the other thing you can, as far as I know, you can isolate a machine learning uh, system and say, yeah, okay, learn and develop and figure things out independent of other machine learning systems, right? And so a, a, a certain emotional system, if it's set up right, could could maybe develop in that in that way. I don't know if I'm talking out of my ass. Am I talking out of my ass? No, you're you're not. And what you're talking about is actually kind of the heart of reinforcement learning. But with the caveat of you still need a really, really good data set to start with. And it's actually funny, as as you were talking, I was thinking, um, and feel free to cut this out if you don't want anyone to know the secret sauce that maybe could make them millions of dollars by using your content. <laughs> if you took an AI bot and ran it through your I don't even know how many like tens of hundreds of hours of content you have reacting to people going back and forth reacting with each other and then you are basically providing the label the ground truth of okay 
what they did was good or okay, what they did was bad. And here is how I would do it. Like that's literally machine learning gold right there in, in spoken form. So man, that would be a, a really cool, if someone could just like give us a million dollars, we'll go off and <laughs> develop this app and, uh, and see if we can change the world with that. Yeah, no, I, I've thought about this. I, I don't know if I've talked about it, but uh, you know, it, it's it's a it's just a matter of time whether it's in my lifetime or after. But I imagine there there'll be something approximating this in my lifetime. In that, uh, yeah, you just have an AI look at maybe even every single video and audio podcast I've ever made and compile a personality out of that, which would be. I'm guessing pretty close, at least to my public personality. It's not the entirety of my personality, but even the machine learning might even be able to extrapolate what I'm like in my personal life. I don't know. And I mean, the way I talk about my personal life. And then uh, a user could have a very long, in-depth, ongoing conversation with me. And that AI could learn about the user and retain that as memories and say, hey, remember that thing you told me? Like how you and and it would be completely indistinguishable from having your own personal Dr. Kirk as as your as your buddy. And and of course, in the near future, there will be laws against using one's image or one's IP. But you can't stop people from having their own personal AI. Uh, on their own server, on their own computer, disconnected from the internet, and they just scrub my entire channel and create their own version of me. That that will happen. That I mean, technically, it could happen right away, but it's not the uh, it's not typical that when these technologies are developed, that random users will have access to that, or it'll be very rare. But in you know, not so different distant future, um, it'll just be it'll just be a thing you can download as an app on on your on your phone and. Uh, and you can train it to do all sorts of stuff, and um, and I I think it's just gonna happen, and I, I'm fine with it, I guess, because what else can I be? But I, uh, uh, well, how do I feel about it? Well, so on the in the interim, I have thought about once this becomes available, I would consider actually having a, an official AI version of me that I could make sure was ethical and on the up and up and had guardrails like you can't have sex with me or something <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and it would be on my website you know and it because that that'll be something that of course you would pay for uh, i would pay for and maybe a subscription service or something and it sounds ridiculous and maybe once it comes around i i wouldn't do it because it would be ridiculous but that this is something that will happen and and all sorts of parasocial relationships will be facilitated this way you know like I, I I want to enter. I want to jam with Paul McCartney. I want to jam with the AI version of Paul McCartney or Prince or something. And if and if the estate of Prince makes that available, then fuck yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. Are you kidding me? To have Prince like laugh at my guitar playing? I mean that that's just the the best thing I could ever think of. So in the same way, you know, yeah, this is um, a couple of years ago I would have thought I'll be well, long dead by the time this happens, but now it looks like it might be happening pretty quickly. And it, by the it by might the way, be happening pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, and by the way, one of the one of the listeners to the podcast reached out to me and works in AI and created, you know, something that's 3% in this direction where it scours all the content on YouTube and spits out certain information. Um, they don't want me to share it with anyone because it's on their own personal server. I, I use it occasionally yeah. just, just as a curiosity and as a tool sometimes. But, but you know, it's already... Uh, it's already happening. Who would you want a parasocial re relationship interact with? Oh, wow. Good question. Who would I want a parasocial? Well, actually, so instead of just answering that, uh, what, what I, there are so many things I wanted to react to what you just said. But one of the things is imagine being able to have that app or, or you know, many different flavors of that app. But let's just go with the, the therapy for now, like having an app that you can log into and uh, instead of like, a, I won't name names for I don't know who's sponsoring your podcast, but like a, a therapy app, and they have that as an option. But imagine if it was like in the voice of your mom, or in the voice of a lost loved one, or, you know, like in, in a voice of someone like truly meaningful to you. Um, and again, all you need is a few seconds of their recorded voice. And and then, you know, all of your knowledge is then being pumped into that voice that I think that that's, 
that's a big bunny idea right there yeah. too. Wow, I, I I hadn't thought about this, but a lot of therapy, the style that I do is reparative work, is corrective emotional experiences. And uh, uh, what I am doing as a therapist for my clients is a lot of the times I'm giving them the parenting emotional vibe that they deserved when they were growing up. So when they're telling me about how proud they am of themselves, I'm also proud of them. When they cry, I'm there for them. And when they were growing up, it was the opposite. And through that, it's well understood through research and, and decades of observation and, and practice that that can help a lot of the ills that people suffer from today, depression, anxiety, lack of meaning in their life, uh, bad relationships, you know, addiction, this kind of thing. But how more powerful would it be to have an AI of their parent that we design together collaboratively, me and the client, and with consent and care, and we pull up on the giant TV screen in in the therapy office and I facilitate, you know, it's very similar to what I, I'll do empty chair work where I'll have the client imagine that their mom is sitting across from them. It's not me, but it, you know, I, we have an empty chair that they're looking at and those, and even just without the person there, it can be one of the most powerful emotional experiences. It, it is transformative for people that, that I've done this kind of work and that I didn't invent it. It's a, it's an old therapy technique, but imagine if we in the empty chair had a computer screen with actually their mom <laughs> and, we, yeah. and we, we dialed in a couple emotional things and and the person was able to you know and of course the client knows it's not their mom but it would really elevate that that emotional landscape it's it's a million dollar idea i'll set up a call with you next week to start prototyping <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, there, there's really amazing things that um, that AI can do that I don't even think that we've like started scratching the surface of. So it's it's an exciting time to be working in AI and working in any kind of scientific field that is collecting data and, you know, really being, you know, and I probably already said this 10 times um, in this past hour and I'll keep on saying it, but the way that we're collecting the data, not just how, not just the data we're collecting, but the way that we are cultivating it and, and making sure that it's you know clean and ethical and unbiased, that is truly going to be what, what shapes the future of AI. And you don't have to answer this question, but if there was a product where you could have a, a friend or a, a mentor, I don't know, someone that checked in on you whenever you wanted them to check in on you, it was a, but it was an AI and you knew it was an AI and it had the a perfect, warm, caring, inquisitive voice, and you could pay three dollars a month for that service. Would you do it? Um, I think absolutely, and I think you know i I've been going to therapy for the better part of my twenties and now into my thirties, and you know a big part of that was the reparenting process and just you know feeling um, feeling you know, like someone cares and like someone, you know, wants to listen. And, and again, when you're in that position, like I mentioned at the beginning of, of the episode of, you know, moving around, you know, year after year, you don't always have that person, whether it's in person or that you've developed in the past that is able to, to be that warm, loving voice. So, and, and even now that I do have those people uh, in my life, I, I still think that, there's so much that even the best of friends can't, um, and nor should we necessarily expect them to um, be able to give that just like, mm, I, I, you can probably say it in better words than me, but just like um, unconditional love. We'll, we'll put it that way. Like unconditional, like that yourself is totally removed from the equation. Let me just like pour into you. And, and sometimes you really need that. Yeah. Yeah. I, if it's convincing enough, then... I don't know how I feel about it though, because mm. I would know, and I don't know if that would matter to me. I think if the AI got good enough, it could be convincing to a lot because that that is like really the key there. Like, is it going to be something that's so robotic, kind of like how the like AI apps when you go to a, a website, they're just like, okay, you're trying to be realistic, but at the end of the day, you're going to get caught in a loop and it's going to piss me off. <laughs> like how far past that can we get mm. with it? Yeah. I mean, eventually, but it, it'll be very convincing. And 
I, I still wonder though how we yeah. as humans will interact with it. And then of course you have children that will be born into the AI universe and will it, it's it's a very interesting question because on one side of course and it'll happen but on the other hand do we have even children born into because you know for old people like me it'll be just weird it'll always be weird but yeah in the same way that to this day cell phones are kind of weird to me but uh people born into the cell phone universe it's just a part of your world and you've you just integrate your life with it neuronally to some extent. So, you know, children are born with AI nannies, for example. My goodness, I hadn't even thought about that. But, um, <laughs> yeah. and of course, you know, there's this whole other tangent of capitalism and how, of course, that this uh, will play into that because if you have AI that costs very little, then you can exploit labor more. Parents could work around the clock or all parents will be out of a job because AI will, you know, I just, all all the implications there. But the um, children that are born into that system, will they biologically need a flesh and blood human being? Even if it's through a phone, do they need to feel that human being is a, a physical presence in the world? Even if we create a physical robot like Data from Star Trek, do we, do we need it to be blood and bones and flesh <laughs> biologically are we did we evolve to to need that that's it's an interesting question you know because we can and now you're asking the questions of the golden age of sci-fi so yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's come full circle we're, we're now here acting it out mm -hmm. and i love data I, I i you know think of him as a robot and his positronic or what was it? I can't remember what the <laughs> neural net somewhere. And he's a machine and he was one of the most human characters on Star Trek as, as I think Picard said. Well, it's interesting because so, okay. So for one, when you think about these apps and products that are already out there that are imitating um, human emotion, usually it's in a, a sexual way, but there are some, I guess that people just use them platonically, but it's typically older men that, right. That they're, they're very lonely and they're seeking out that companionship and, and they go to these apps. And so kind of like going against that point of it, it takes a, a younger person to be able to really believe it. But then you ask yourself, okay, why, why these people um, and, and then you think about the, the, the new generation being born right now and how the parenting style, the, the parenting style is becoming, I think, more and more hands on, more and more nurturing. I think we could potentially argue that in a few decades ago. So <clears throat> with that being said, even though they are getting more integrated into um, interacting with AI, they will also probably probably be so um, used to just the tender love and care from their parents that they might not need AI in that mm -hmm. way. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, well, that would be a nice future. <laughs> and, and, and then, of course, I think teachers, right? You can, at the very least, have, as an adjunct to school, have an AI teacher that would walk yeah. you through lessons and tailor the learning to each student individual which you know there's so, so did you say there's apps right now for yeah. people to sexually interact with there are yeah i and uh, this must have been like a maybe six months to a year ago that i was watching just some documentary on youtube that was exploring all these different apps that are currently out there so don't ask me to like name any of them but i know they're out there and people are actively using them is it just chat based um, I believe it's just chat based at this point, you know, I bet that there are voice based ones just because of how readily accessible that, um, that, that product is. So I, I would imagine that they're already being used. And do they have like some stock photo that the individuals are? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't think it's to the point yet where it's at the deep fake level, but again, I don't know. This is you know, just hearsay from the documentary, I'm sure that they can. And if you can create it, they probably have created it, even if it's like a micro app. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hmm. And it's machine learning. It's not just like a script. Yes. Um, yeah, I know this is actually machine learning that is very believable from what I was seeing. Huh. And you just dial it in like, I want 
a dominatrix or I want a sub or something. The way that they sell them, the way that they sell them is more so like, um, you know, like the, the app, like what is it called? Second life. Uh, yeah. where mm-hmm. like you're, you're just actually like playing this game and interacting with it. Like it's your second life. It's, it's, it gave me that vibe where it's more just like, come, you know, come and chat with Jenny and then like you and Jenny just build a relationship and not so much like, I'm prompting you to be a dominatrix, but like, tell me about your day. I love you. I miss you so much. It's really interesting. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Huh. I mean, I knew stuff like that was happening, but I didn't know AI. For some reason, I thought the builders of AI were avoiding that market as of yet, but of course would get into it later. But of course, we know that that's one of the first money markets that you can... (laughs) get into right well and then this really brings up like the conversation around so uh you know there are ai engineers all over the world with all different types of motivations and you know us that are looking to build ai for good ai for all ai for corporate you know ai for for non-nefarious um of course we wouldn't necessarily think of building that but you know a, a big part of this um the executive order that just came out today by the white house was trying to build a whole bunch of safeguards into the fact that like we know that there are bad guys out there and that like bad guys that's like a whole another level than building sex bots but like we know that there are truly bad guys out there that know how to use ai because it just takes a few years of training to get really good at ai and what's to stop them from you know doing really bad things with the same technology that we are using to do really good things so someone could have a home server and develop their own AI machine and do yeah. all the things that we're seeing these other AI do? Yeah, I mean, I do it every day. I'll like think of an idea of like, I mean, that's how I started my app. I was like, hey, I have this idea. Let me pull up, uh, you know, these days we use cloud computing a lot of the time. So like AWS, Google, Microsoft, those kind of companies. But you just pull up an instance and you start making these models, which nowadays, you know, machine learning is so commonplace. They actually have these concept called auto ML, auto machine learning, where you can just literally type in, and you can actually, you can do this on GPT. So if you're at your you know computer right now, if you have a, a GPT account, type into it, write me a Python code to um, create a recommendation engine for recommending books. It will literally give you the code to do that, you would copy and paste that into a Jupyter notebook or like an AWS notebook and it will run and it, and it will work. So that's where we've gotten to with our development. Anyone can do it. Wow. Wow. I, yeah. I, I didn't know that. I thought AI was like some supercomputer shit that you needed like <laughs> way more computing power to run the machine learning. But you're saying that any dumb laptop can become an AI. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's a good point, right? So um, it's really the difference between an algorithm and a model and a supermodel. Um, that's funny, a supermodel. But um, so an algorithm is just, uh, you know, there. Like, let's talk about like recommendation engine. Like there is an algorithm for a recommendation engine that just says, first you do this, then you add it to this, divide it by this, multiply it by this, and then you have your answer. And you can just write that in code and say, okay, I have this machine learn, And that doesn't take anything at all. You just need like a notepad to write that. Then when the data comes in and how much data and how you're processing the, the data, that's what will be the difference of can I run this locally or do I need to spend thousands of dollars? And like GPT, for example, I think they're I spending something like $700,000 like a day or a week or whatever it is to, to run GPT. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's how much data do you need to train that model, that algorithm. I see. So if I had that Python code and I put it on some situation and I'm running it just for myself and I feed a bunch of info into what books I like and what books I don't like. Yeah. And since the data set isn't very big, cause it's just me, then the machine learning slowly figures out an algorithm or weights to the neural uh, uh, calculations that's specific to me and very good yep. about that. But it's but it's a low data crunching situation because it's not trying to do for every human on the planet. 
Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times I will just play around with proof of concepts on my computer with, you know, maybe like 10,000 rows of data, something where to learn from it, but not necessarily be an amazing algorithm uh, or model. And then once you are really confident with the model, then that's when you would go and start spending thousands on compute power to build something spectacular. You should do it for Tinder yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should uh, put some app on your phone and then say, okay, figure out. Uh, and then after you go on a date, you would feed in ratings and then, you know, all that machine learning. Or I guess you could even just historically just say, look at my entire Tinder history and I'll tell you exactly how many dates I went. And it has all the chat logs too on Tinder. I'm yeah. just saying uh, you could have your own I'm sure they're already doing it because like on Hinge after you, so they know when you give someone your phone number and about a day or two later, they'll say, did you meet this person? Um, so they're like, they're, they're doing it already. <laughs> mm, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's not tailored to you, you know, like you, because yeah. you could feed in more data, like, you know, this, this person's a good seven date person, but this person looks like they might be like forever dating <laughs> sort of, I don't know. Uh, or this person was not only a no to a second date, but was a sharp no. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. It just seems like just seems like. And then you could ask your dating people to put in data for themselves. I, I don't know. I'm just yep. saying. Uh, 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 since you, yeah, but you're just huh. giving me more app ideas, Kirk. I don't have enough time to create all these apps. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's kind of the thing that I think we're looking at over the next five to ten years is yeah. just all of this potential and of course you know there's a lot of money to be made and um <laughs> you know earlier we we're talking about uh, romance and porn i suppose by extension and i remember in the early days of the internet that i remember there was this feeling that i had that a lot of other people had which was the internet could be great but it's so small at this point you know like late late 90s and i remember that i could see the potential but I think there was one website that I went to, and I think it was like a Princess Die website. And I'm not even interested in Princess Die or the royal family, but because the website was like mildly interesting, I don't, I think I looked at it every day. There, there wasn't anything else to look at. There were no news websites. There, there was no Google. There was no you know gaming or anything. It was just this open book of this you know let's see what we can do. But there was this problem because there wasn't uh, enough. Uh, investment from corporations or from uh, entrepreneurs to do anything because there wasn't enough customers yet. So you had this kind of catch-22, like, well, people aren't going to make websites that are interesting until we get customers, and customers aren't going to come until you have websites. And then there was this huge explosion through the early aughts, you know, dot-com stuff. And we were happy, but I heard from people that knew these things that really what drove the internet was porn, <laughs> that uh, yeah. you, yep. you had porn providers and there were customers like just champing at the bit because up until this point, you had to either subscribe to a random cable channel or you had to go into a store and purchase things. You know, I mean, it's not only inconvenient, but it can be shameful for some people or worrisome and to just sit at home on their computer and, and dial in these things. And so instantly there was all this money flooding in. I, I, I somehow heard, heard percentages of, you know, like 60 to 90% of the initial commerce and building of the internet was based on pornography. And then other things came, the, all the other stuff, you know, Google and Amazon. And, all. and, yeah. and then I think, well, with AI, it, it, we might be hitting a similar kind of impasse, but of course the demand for porn or someone to interact with on that level might be the the catalyst that pushes AI into the stratosphere. Mm. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting concept. And I think about this a lot too, just like the concept of, you know, like 10, 20 years ago with the internet, we had all of these really big visions and it feels like so little of them have really been accomplished that have made it mainstream. And I think the problem is just when things get so massive, like Google and Facebook and Amazon, so massive that it becomes exponentially harder to make really big changes, those kind of innovative changes. But that's why all of these startups, especially these startups that are in the AI space, are, are going to be the ones that are able to make that impact that you're not able to see. Like, 
I so one of the things I do on the side, um, I work with an AI incubator um, here in Miami. Just it's like a something for startups when you're trying to start up a company, um, just like helping companies get off the ground. Um, and people will always ask, like, okay, well, shouldn't I like be in stealth mode? Shouldn't I like not be trying to tell anyone about my my app because you know Amazon can just go off and build it, but in reality, they're not going to, they have, so they're just trying to keep their, you know, their website afloat and making sure people are happy that they, they don't have the time to build the app that you're building. Mm -hmm. And the model is you make a great app and they buy it from you and you make the business. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. The last thing I'll say is if you dear listener are listening to this in 2028 and beyond, you'll be giggling throughout this entire episode because <laughs> everything will have progressed to that point and everything I'm saying now will sound like I'm this old man in 1900s talking about how there are these horseless carriages. So I beg you, please understand that the things that I'm saying are extremely advanced for the people of my time. Most people don't even know the shit that I'm talking about. So stop laughing at me. I'm a <laughs> smart person. And thanks for coming on the podcast, Janetta George. Do you want people to reach out to you at all or, or find you? or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, CandorAI.co is my website. Um, you can find me on Instagram at two underscores and then my name, Janetta. I'd uh, love to connect on AI. Or if you're uh, on, on Hinge and into AI and living in Miami, then maybe this is better than Hinge. <laughs> So on Instagram, two underscores, J-E-N-N, -N, two N's, E-T-T, -T, two T's, A, Janetta. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Janetta. And um, what are you looking forward to me reacting to next? Oh, good question. So I'm, I'm all caught up on everything you've done for, uh, for Love is Blind. You know, 90 Day Fiance, they've got like 10 different spinoffs going on right now. I, I'm never overwhelmed by 90 Day Fiance, but I am overwhelmed by the content right now. So I think they just, they need to come up with a new episode, a new, new spinoff for, uh, specifically for Kirk to react to. And then I'll listen to that. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm in the process of watching Last Resort still, even though I'm pretty sure that season is over. And also watching... Uh, Mary and what's his face. But yeah, there's another season that just started not long ago and I'm planning on taking a poll and seeing which couple I should watch from that season. So there, there's a new straight up 90 Day Fiance and there are a few really interesting couples. There's an interesting couple and I can't even remember their name, but the, the girl, she's got long blonde hair and she's from the UK and the guy is from like LA or something that that'll be a good couple to react to. They've got some interesting stuff going on. Okay. I'm intrigued. <laughs> and everyone out there, please take care of yourself. Janetta, why should they take care of themselves? Because they deserve it. They really, really do.